Welcome to a brand new year and a brand new quarter. The book of Isaiah is the study for this quarter and it's going to be an exciting study to learn more from one of the minor prophets or major prophets, not minor, major prophets in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. Brian, welcome to our new quarter. Wow, it's such a privilege and a blessing to be alive and uh, study with you again, Renir, and uh, to our viewers, welcome. We thank God for his protection and his grace and mercy during 2020. 2021 looks like it's going to be a difficult year, but without God, it's going to be a good year. Uh, yeah, we enjoyed uh, just uh, being used of the Lord, and we pray for a special blessing this year as well. Amen. Thank you very much for that. As Brian said, this year, we don't know what's going to be, what, what this world has in store for us. But what we do know that our God is real, he's alive, and he's got a plan for our lives. And we're inching closer to the right. second coming of Christ. Our theme text, yes. oh, let's pray. Yeah, yeah, almost forgot. It's been a while. So let's pray mm -hmm. together. Um, Brian, would you just pray for us as we start this lesson? Sure. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful time we have to study your word again. As we dive into the book of Isaiah, the gospel prophet, we pray that, Lord, the themes of redemption, your love, your grace, and also your justice may be prevalent in our hearts and minds. We appreciate you for the God you have been. Bless each viewer and bless us with your spirit to understand the deeper life giving power and message from the book of Isaiah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 1 verse 18 is the theme text, probably one of the most popular scriptures in Isaiah. There are quite a few, but especially this one. Right. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So this is a wonderful promise in the word of God, while God's people have rejected him and gone on their own way. They also refer to Isaiah 1 verse 2 and 3. Actually, the whole chapter 1 is really important for this study. Um, but I want to read to you Isaiah 1 verse 2 and 3. Um, I'll put it up on the screen for our viewers to read with. It says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. So God explains the state of his, his people in relation to a parent raising their children. And he says that his people have rebelled against him. And in this quarter, we're going to find out why, what happened, and also the redemption theme throughout the book of Isaiah as to what God's goal is when his people rebel against him. And it's actually a beautiful, beautiful story. It's actually the great controversy, the great the right. plan behind the scenes that is portrayed within this book as to how God's people fell, how God then put the plan in place which was there, long before we existed, to save us from rebellion and to help us to come into connection with him. So Sunday's part is about this year, O heavens. And they said we should read verses 1 through 9. Now, we're not going to read all of it, just verse 2 that I've already read, where it talks about God saying, here, or prophet Isaiah writing under the inspiration of God, Hear, O heavens, <clears throat> excuse me, and the earth. We can also read this in Deuteronomy 4.26, where Moses speaks and he says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses. That's mm -hmm. more used more than once in the scriptures. Brian, what can we learn from this? That the book of Isaiah starts with this, that this is not just for God's people. Right. This, this goes beyond this. God says, something different i almost wanted to give the answer now but so you tell us brian why does the prophet isaiah write like this so what comes to my mind is when you think about uh, especially in the book of revelation chapter 12 uh, verses 12 13 there it says uh, rejoice all ye heavens 
And uh, he says, but fear you inhabitants of this earth. Uh, why are the heavens to rejoice? Uh, because the accuser of your brethren has been cast down. In other words, Satan, that's at the cross. It's in the context of the cross. When the uh, unfallen worlds, when the angels that did not rebel, that remained true and loyal to God in heaven, there were still questions about God's character and the accusations and insinuations that Satan had made. But we know from the cross, as we read uh, John chapter 12, Jesus just before the cross says, now the prince of this world will be judged, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself, um, indicated that immediately, and Ellen White corroborates this in the book, Desire of Ages, that when the angel saw the character of Satan completely unmasked now, mm. as he took the life of Jesus, they made up their minds completely. They would have absolutely nothing to do with Satan. And uh, so he was restricted from approaching the angels and the unfallen worlds in the heavens. And it says, woe unto you and the inhabitant of this earth for the devil has come unto you knowing that he has but a short time. So, so Satan's life was since the cross restricted completely to this earth. So when you think about that, Renil, then um, the story of Job chapter one tells us of the councils, the heavenly councils that God had with the unfallen worlds. And um, we find there the 24 elders, I believe, um, that around the throne represent these uh, leaders of unfallen worlds. But the point is, if the angels and the unfallen worlds have made up their minds, um, so God addressing uh, the world saying, now, now, now what more could he have done? Um, all have seen, but my people whom I love and have cherished, they seem not to see, or they are in. So this is really a, a really um, an important call that God is making. But also, I believe you can add in a secondary sense, you know, uh, God uses um, these kind of analog analogies, I should say. Um, and uh, he will use illustrations from nature to represent things that are true and real in the lives of his people. So, so here when he calls, you know, and the trees of the hills shall clap their hands. Um, he's using this, you know, uh, kind of language, and we, we find Isaiah used a lot of poetic language to describe the reactions of God's people, what they ought to be, and nature, of course, teaches this, but uh, he says, as the text you read there, uh, you know, my people don't know. The donkey knows its master's crib. He will go to the feeding trough, you know, because he knows his master is putting food there for him. Um, the, the, the cattle will go to the manger and feed there. Uh, but my people, Israel, called after my name, they don't know. In other words, they've rebelled. They have turned back from God and um, they have rejected the love, the mercy that God offers to them. And it's also interesting to note that in Paul's writings, he says that we are like an open letter, open book for the universe to see. Right. So yes. God is saying to us that whatever he's doing in our life is not just for my own personal experience here within my family, within my church, within whatever influence I have, wherever I find myself. But this is a, a, a larger picture that God is busy painting. And I believe right. that picture is, that painting is at the end. It's really at the end, mm -hmm. the last few um, strokes being made before Jesus returns. So God says, my plan of salvation is not just for the world to understand, it's not just for the sinner in this world to understand, you and I, but it's for every single being in the universe to understand. For the angels, mm -hmm. for the unfallen worlds, to show that God is just and he is love. Even when his people rebels, he calls everyone as a witness that my plan for my people is verse 18. Turn yes. from your sins. I will forgive you. And we will talk more about that just now. So, Heaven and earth is called as witnesses or as, as the audience to see God's plan being fulfilled. Now, Brian, what sins did God's people commit? What, what happened? You know, in these verses 1 through 9, we can see what happened. What happened there that God says, what was the main issue that God pointed out within verses 1 through 9? I think we can sum it up by the word sin, and uh, it really means in this context rebellion. 
And in Daniel 9.25, it says that, you know, Messiah will uh, finish the transgression or, and make an end of sin. So the rebellion, the revolt, the missing of the mark, the high calling of God, that uh, he had led them uh, to have the special favor. He had led them, rather, not led them. He had led them to have the special favor, this covenant relationship uh, that he established really in the Garden of Eden with, with Adam and with Eve. Um, and which was really reestablished with probably Abraham. I mean, also with Noah, of course, the covenant mm. of the rainbow was there. But, you know, with Abraham, in thee and in uh, thy seed shall all nations be blessed. Of course, speaking of Christ, the, the seed, the true seed, according to Galatians 3. Uh, but the point is, Rainier, as we look at uh, Israel's life uh, or relationship, I should say, with their God, it was one of continual backsliding. There were some times when they came, you know, when there was a good king and there was a revival, like with Joash, for example. And then as soon as there was a bad king like Manasseh, you know, things just went way down. Mm. And they'd be back in the groves. They'd be back under the trees, worshipping the idols by the terebinths. And um, the thing is this year, when we look at Israel's uh, relationship with their God, Sometimes we can easily, you know, say, well, you know, that was Israel. And we neglect to look at, is our relationship true and committed to Christ? Are we not just like Israel, if not worse? Because, I mean, we are living in the time of the gospel that has been ratified with the blood of Jesus. We are living in the time when Messiah has come. They were before Messiah. I mean. Everything they looked at was in pictures and symbols. Uh, today we have the reality of Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. So, so I, I think, you know, we ought to take a stock of our lives. Where do I stand? And am I in a true covenant relationship with Jesus? A, a, am I keeping the terms of the covenant, which of course is his law? A, a, am I walking with Christ or am I also rebellious? Am I also mm -hmm. holding on to... Um, sins secret sins or you know darling sins sins that um, so easily beset us and so i think this is a real call where we should look where am i with my lord uh, israel yes god loved them but god always reached out to them as he does to us today so their major thing was they as you used the word rebel they forsook god right. they went on their own way following their own methods do having their own thoughts and it led to their ruin through the kingdom of Babylon. Right. That was the, the end result in the end of the day. So Monday's part talks about a rotten ritualism. Let's mm. go to Isaiah 1 and verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, this is mm. an interesting phrase in scripture that God uses through his writers um, since the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We find this Jesus saying that as days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. We find in the writings of Peter, 2 Peter 2 verse 6, where Peter says mm -hmm. that they, were ex they are an example for those who live godly, ungodly at the end of time. And mm -hmm. in Jude 1 verse 7, he talks about this being destroyed by everlasting fire and that the ungodly will go through this too. So here we clearly see that God uses Sodom and Gomorrah as an example for those who will live ungodly. God mm. wants us to understand that he, what he, let me put it this way. There are certain people that have been resurrected in the scriptures for a reason, or at least one that we know of, apart from those who came alive on the earth and still lived and then um, died later again but we have those that came out of the graves that when christ was um, resurrected but especially moses and moses the, he's the example of those that will be resurrected when jesus returns and the reason god did that was to explain that my word is truth and what i said that i would do that i would do if i say there's a resurrection then surely it would happen now the same with Sodom and gomorrah it literally happened. So God says, hellfire, brimstone, all these things is going to come. 
It's literally happened in the past. It's literally going to happen in the future. So God is making this point that Sodom and Gomorrah is the example of ungodliness. And in the end of time, we're seeing it again. I mean, if you think that they went after strange flesh, the Bible says. And today, man, that is, that is people are fighting for the right to go after strange flesh in our world today. So, Brian, because of this, the Sodom and Gomorrah state of Israel, God then rejects their, or not rejects, but does not accept their offerings, their sacrifices. Mm -hmm. You can read it in verses 11 to 15. Why did God not accept this? Why, why does God go there? Why does he say, your sacrifices, your offerings means nothing? What is God looking after um, in the end of the day? So, so God is looking for the heart, the motive and intentions of the heart. Because many times, you know, in the book of uh, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah chapter 17, if I'm not uh, uh, correct, uh, incorrect, he says that um, I try the heart, says the Lord, mm. and I know it. But prior to that, it says, uh, for who can know the heart? It is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. So in other words, their religion had become rotten, corrupted. It was filled with formalism. Um, the, the same situation consist, consisted uh, in the religion of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus called them uh, hypocrites and uh, he called them uh, white uh, painted sepulchres. He said, you know, outside your, you know, you, you look, your tomb, the tomb, looks good outside, it's painted, it's, it looks good, but inside it's full of dead men's bones. So their religion was one of uh, pretension. Their religion was one of selfish gain. And, and yet, uh, metaphorically to represent how low had become their religion. So, so the most important thing, Renira, I would like to say to our viewers is, you know, religion is one thing. But the most important thing is your relationship. I mean, many wars have been fought over religion. Uh, and, and you think about it over worship. You think about the first war, the first murder uh, on earth was when Abel killed his, his brother, when Cain killed his brother Abel. I mean, that was over worship. Uh, think about the rebellion in heaven before even sin came to this earth. It was over worship. So war began in heaven. So, so many, many a war has been fought over religion. And it has been bad religion. But, um, you know, when there's a relationship, a loving relationship between God and his people, then their religion becomes that which is pure, a religion which is from the heart of love. So, so Sodom and Gomorrah, when we think about Sodom and Gomorrah, we think of, you know, immorality. We think about sexual sins, uh, sodomy, which comes from the word Sodom. I mean, is, is, brings up one of the most, you know, revolting things in your mind. But when you look at the people of Israel called by this name, man, this is something that uh, should give them, God intend them to, to think, think where you are. Look at where you are. Besides the sexual immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, we remember a lot looked toward the plains. Uh, it was a fruitful land. There was commerce and industry. They were motivated by gain, materialism. Um, idolatry was rampant amongst those cities. Selfishness. Um, so, so, so these are the characteristics or traits of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's said that this was now the condition of God's people, Israel. Uh, later on, we see in chapter 5, it speaks of them as bringing forth wild grapes. All their sins uh, are represented as being the reason for their desolation. So just as Sodom and Gomorrah, the sins and wickedness of the inhabitants led to the desolation of the cities, God said, listen, your character, the fruits that you're bringing, your lives, your words, your, 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 your treatment of other people, the injustice, uh, the taking away of widows' uh, homes and uh, not taking care of the poor, these works will uh, be recompensed by desolation. And of course, Assyria first came and took the northern kingdom, and then Babylon came and took captive the southern kingdom. And, and this was during the time of Isaiah, just before the time of Isaiah. Of course, Israel lost their kingdom, the northern tribes. 
between the time of Isaiah and then of course the time of Daniel, um, that's when of course the southern kingdom Judah, to whom Isaiah's prophesying, prophesying to, warning them, listen, come back in line with your God. Uh, be, uh, cease to do evil. In other words, we can only cease to do evil when we have the right relationship with God. And, and so this is so full with meaning as to, for them in their time and for us where we are today. Amen. Thank you for that explanation. If you think of 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, where Samuel writes and he says, Does, let me read, let me rather read the complete scripture so that the oh, yeah. viewers can get the full picture and I don't quote a half the scripture here. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Then Samuel said, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in mm -hmm. obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, right. to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. rams. Yeah. So here the Bible tells us it is more important for God that I obey him than bring sacrifices. Right. So God is, 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 is very serious when he says we need to obey him. And not think that I can just, you know, disobey and bring, if I bring my offerings, uh, ask for forgiveness of my sins in our time, asking for forgiveness of God is love. He will forgive me. I can just do the same thing over and over and over again. And yes, praise mm -hmm. the Lord. He will forgive me. And that's our next subject. The argument of forgiveness. Isaiah 1 verse 18. When we bring our sins to Christ, he's willing and able to forgive us. Doesn't Amen. matter how many times I've done it. He wants me to come and receive forgiveness. But forgiveness is not just about being cleansed from that which I've done wrong. It actually also mm. empowers me to turn from that which I've done wrong. Brian, how do you understand this argument of forgiveness in relation to Israel? Uh, it's, it's, it's the marvelous grace and message from the Creator God. And when you think about, you know, the text you just read there, you know, to obey is better than to sacrifice and says, and rebellion is that of witchcraft. So, so Satan has uh, bewitched people into worshiping God in any way that they think is okay. And, and he just says, okay, God will accept it. And yet God accepts true heart worship. Jesus said, uh, these people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And he was quoting Isaiah, by the way. Uh, and so that was the condition of, of Judah. You know, uh, it was outward forms of worship, but inside of them um, was selfishness, was greed, was gain. And here God is saying, listen, um, if you will be willing and obedient, if you will choose to cooperate with me, then you will eat the good of the land. Then you will ride in the high places uh, of Jacob. So, so when you think about uh, God's plan of restoration, it's all, it's all encapsulated in God's love, mercy, and forgiveness. That's the argument that God is bringing now because he's saying, I mean, it's like a cup. It's not like, it is the covenant relationship. And God is reminding them of the covenant relationship that Israel made, of course, just before they enter the promised land in Deuteronomy 27 through to 30, are the curses and the blessings of the covenant, uh, which of course we will come to later. But the point is uh, God saying, if you will return to me, I'll forgive you. In fact, my forgiveness is there already. My pardon is guaranteed. But what is the condition? If you are willing and obedient. So there is our part. God never ever will do what we are supposed to do. There's God, the covenant promises God's part is for sure guaranteed. But do Israel or Judah, do we respond to the covenant promises and their conditions? Thank you for that. So returning to the Lord is vitally important. That's what the text is also right. trying to teach us. You can read mm. especially in Isaiah 44, 22, that when we have received this pardon, when we have received this forgiveness, we need to return unto the Lord. Walk yes. in His ways. Walk in obedience, as Brian has alluded to the text again in 1 Samuel chapter 15. It's not just about receiving forgiveness and then continuing with the evil lifestyle or the evil choices that we make, but rather allowing forgiveness to transform my heart. God's mm -hmm. love, which is 
it contains forgiveness is the very attribute that draws us to the place where we don't want to sin against him. Right. Why would we want to crucify him afresh? So God is saying to his people, you know, all these sacrifices, offerings, it points to the fact that I want to forgive you. I want to cleanse you. I want to get you away from your current state of mind. Mm. But you need to accept the things that I've asked of you. You need to do the things that I've asked of you. And unfortunately, Israel did not do that. They rebelled against God. Instead of being drawn to him, they, would, they moved away because of selfish motives, selfish ideas, finding their own ways, doing their own things, and not listening to the word of God. Wednesday's part so, is to... Yes, Brian? Sorry, Renita, I just wanted to say, you know, in Isaiah 42 and verses 20, uh, 44, 22, rather, uh, it speaks of God blotting out their sins. Um, and, and this is uh, language that uh, Peter uses in Acts, uh, speaking of the blotting out of sins. And of course, that is uh, sanctuary imagery. Um, and we think about the Day of Atonement. Uh, God wants to blot out the sins of Israel like a cloud. And, and the cloud of incense that went above the mercy seat um, on the Day of Atonement, as the priest, the high priest would go in before the Ark of the Covenant, and put blood, um, the blood of the Lord's goat on that uh, mercy seat. Uh, he says, I have redeemed thee. So, so we, we can't redeem ourselves. Um, the religion of God, the, the religion of Israel, I should say, uh, showed in all the sanctuary services that the, their source of redemption and their source of salvation came from outside of themselves. When you went to the heathen temples, it was the opposite. They came and brought penance and did some sort of act to atone, whereas God says to his people, listen, I have redeemed them. Of course, how does he redeem us? With the blood of his son. So we think about the sins being of scarlet, red. Of course, the guilt is shown in, in, in the blood, but we find it is blood also, the blood of the Lord's God, Jesus Christ, that brings about that cleansing or the blotting out of the sins of Israel. So I, I like that theme that goes all through the Bible that God mm. says, I, I want to save you because I love you, yes. but I can't save you against your own will. That's why it says, if you be willing, a choice. Mm. Uh, and of course, we know that text there in Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel 33, 11, why will you die, O house of Israel? You know, uh, choose life. He says, I've said before you life and death. Blessing and curses. But he's saying, choose life. I've given all. What more can I do for you? I have given you all. And all I'm waiting for you is to respond and cooperate with me. Amen. Well, that's the good news. The good news of the Amen. gospel. Let's go to Wednesday's part. To eat or be eaten. I'm going to read Isaiah Amen. 1, 19 and 20. Isaiah 1 verses 19 and 20. If you are willing, and that's what Brian basically said now. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. What a promise. Mm -hmm. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here basically, and we have really touched on this in depth already, but we can just expand a little bit more. Is that there are two choices. One, obey and live. The other, disobey and die. It's the natural result of sin rather than God destroying his own people. It's yes. the natural result of the path that you take when your master is Satan, when you're doing what he says. And the scary thing is today is that when we are on this path of the devil and we believe we are on the other one. That's the mm. scary part. That's where the Pharisees found themselves. And that's why Jesus devoted a whole chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, to the Pharisees, saying, woe unto you. And he even tells us in Matthew 23, do what they say, but do not do what they do. So they are principled. Yeah. They want to do what is right, but they do it with self being in control. And that's a dangerous thing. So God gives us this promise. If I do good by following what he says, being willing and obedient. God says there will be blessings. That's what Moses said to the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy. When he says, choose life. Why would you choose death? And 
Elijah preached the same thing on Mount Carmel when he said also choose life or death. And these right. are the examples that we have in the Bible that if you do what is right, God will bless you. I don't do what is right because I want a blessing. I do what is right because I love God. And that will lead to a blessing because God takes care of his children. Brian, why two choices, uh, Renier, if I may ask that question? Why? Uh, I mean, yeah, because sometimes people, you know, think, well, is there no middle ground? Mm. Is there no other option? Um, and I think Jesus uh, made it very clearly in terms of service. But uh, why would there just be two choices? Because God does not want us to compromise. Because mm -hmm. many times if we compromise by finding a gray area, we most of the time will lean towards the wrong side. The compromise yeah. leads to the wrong side, not to the right side. Mm -hmm. For instance, a friend said to me in, in the past that he needs to go to the pubs to preach to his friends. You know, he needs to be, he won't drink the alcohol, but he needs to be there to preach to his friends. But as soon as he enters the pub, the holy angels stay behind and the evil yeah. angels welcomes his presence. So here is a compromise for the sake of the gospel. And that compromise will lead to the wrong side because God's angels cannot protect anymore. The Holy Spirit cannot enter. Therefore, you're on your own. And which side are you going to go to? We don't have the power to resist. We don't have the power within ourselves to live a righteous life. We need all the help that we can get. Therefore, God says that's just one of the reasons, but God has a right side. There is no compromise. It's right or it is wrong. And you know, many people are like that. It's black or it's white. And that's the right wow. thing. That is the way to be like, is to do what is right, always in the sight of the Lord. Brian, what, do you maybe have more reasons? Yeah, why I, I, I think Jesus summed it up very nicely. And, and, and what you said is absolutely true. You know, there is no middle ground. You know, it, it's either black or white, uh, good or evil. And, and, uh, and Christ said, no man can serve two masters. Uh, for he will either hate one or serve the other. Mm. And, and um, Paul sums it up uh, by saying that uh, to whom you are servants to obey, to, to whom you obey, you belong. Uh, so it's either we with Christ or with Satan. Uh, and, and many times you know, people say, well, you know, um, there's good in all of us. Um, where does that good come from? By the fact there's something good means there has to be one who is the originator of good. The fact that there's something evil also needs, by definition, to be shown that there is an originator of evil. You know, many people don't even believe in Satan. I've met some people who are even, you know, leaning towards Christianity or accept what the Bible says, but they say there's no devil, you know. The devil's a thought of your mind. That's exactly how you would like it to be. But, but evil, by nature, there is one who is behind that evil. And, and when, when Christ addressed the devil, he said, He of your father, the devil. I mean, religious leaders, by the way, in uh, John chapter 8. And, 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 and then, of course, he addressed those who are of God. So we're either on the Lord's side or we are on the side of the rebel, and, uh, the, 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 the adversary, Satan. And, and, and that's why we always have two choices. We're either with God or we're with the devil. The devil would like us to believe that we're okay. We can be religious and be okay, but yet we're really lost because we're on his side. But with God, it's very clear. You're either in a loving relationship with him that leads to obedience or you're really not. I think the important thing that we must maybe just clarify for the viewers at this stage, what does this look like practically? I want to just to explain what this would look like. Because I know that there are certain viewers that might would sit there and say, yeah, when it comes to a certain holiday or a certain this, this is the only way that is right. And this is, this is where I just want to maybe give an example of what would it look like to not compromise, yet be perfectly obedient within God's will. And some people will think, yeah, but you are compromising. And this is, this is the way to approach it. Let's say the topic food. You know, food can be evil and good. That is the truth, right? So the topic of food is not the problem here. What we do then is if we need to line our wills with God's will, we just ask God, what is your will in relation to food? And then he explains his will. Don't eat unclean feeds. 
food feeds food. Don't eat unclean foods. Don't eat meat with blood in it. Don't eat the fat, etc. So God gives us the clear guidelines as to what his will would look like while the topic of food is in front of me. So I need to take each of these topics, put it in front of me, the music that I listen to. What is God's will in relation to music? Music in itself is not evil. Um, all television in itself is not evil. It is what's God's will in each of these subjects. And there That's we right. don't compromise. So if God says don't eat unclean foods, then what I do is I never eat unclean foods, period. End of the story. Don't compromise for anyone for for grace sake or for love's sake, you don't compromise. So that's the way we need to approach all subjects that we are faced with in this lifetime. If like for instance, Christmas just recently took place and there are so many people that are against it in Adventism, like in totally against it. Now, if you are convicted, do not do anything, not outreach, nothing, you know, that is your conviction. But God has given us guidelines. And as long as I stay in those guidelines, even within that, I'm not compromising. I'm doing God's will. It's still what is black and what is white. It is still based upon the will of God as revealed through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And so it is with all subjects. So I thought I just need to throw that in there. What does it look like practically? You take each yeah. individual circumstance, put it in front of you and ask God, what is your will as revealed in the scriptures? And the spirit of prophecy. Then Thanks. That's good. Benid. And uh, when I think about that, uh, you know, to eat or to be eaten, uh, I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whatever you eat mm. or whatever you do, do it what? All to the glory of God. And you express that as his will. So, so that is God's will for us, living an obedient life and that we will follow the path that he has chosen for us, which is his will. Amen. As he has revealed it for us. Right. Then Thursday's part. Ominous love song. This is Isaiah 5 verses 1 through 7. I'm just going to read verse 7. Mm -hmm. As we end our first lesson for 2021. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. It's an explanation of the song. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Brian, why does Isaiah use the symbol of a vineyard? To point to God's so that's, people. That's an important uh, question because, uh, again, uh, Jesus used that symbol metaphorically himself. And um, he, he, he points to himself as being the vine. Um, and, and, and when you think about the fruit of the vine that he served to his disciples when he instituted uh, the Lord's Supper, um, the, the, and, and when you think about it, the first miracle he did was turning uh, water into wine. The wine resembled, of course, the purity of the fruit and the grape juice in its pureness, represents the fruit of righteousness. Jesus' fruit was to give his life, his righteous life for us. And then, of course, Jesus used the wine then as a symbol of his blood that was shed. Um, so when you think about the vineyard, um, it probably was the most, uh, and, and a vineyard was also, a vine rather, was engraved into the pillars of the temple. Uh, it reflected... God's will for his people, Israel. And, and when you think about the illustration, you know, the love song, when you think about um, the fact that um, the husbandman, uh, he's singing a song to his beloved, which is to God, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that God has dug around here and he's cultivated and he's removed all these uh, stones. Uh, he has put a, a wall. I mean, the stones have been all those rebellious, uh, stubborn, uh, you know, Ezekiel says, I'll, I'll take the stony heart that is out of you. So all those rebellious nations that God had removed and made room in the promised land for Israel, where he wanted to plant his vine, uh, they became like that. But he had removed the stones. He had cultivated it. He had placed a wall around it. Um, that would be protection, right? 
And God's law is a hedge. Um, you think about the tower, the tower would represent the temple. Um, and you think about this temple rejects the one. Jesus says, you know, because you have rejected me just before the cross, he says, your house is left unto you desolate, your temple, your tower. Uh, and so he used the analogy of the fruit tree, which we could say was as the vine, the fig tree rather, that was cursed, remember? Uh, mm. So we look at this here. Uh, the wine press was to bring in the fruit. And, and this was to be the, um, the, the character that God wanted for his people. But instead, what did they bring forth? Wild grapes. In other words, they, they, their lives showed that the character, the heart, was filled with selfishness, pride, and arrogance, and idolatry. And that's exactly what was the condition. You think about Isaiah lives 65 years, is his, his ministry through those different kings. And finally, Manasseh um, takes his life. He's sawn in half. And, and he dies speaking to Israel, or Judah rather. He also spoke to Israel as well. But primarily to Judah saying, return unto me. Come back to me and I will heal you, says the Lord. So this, this love song is all about the fact that God is saying, listen, I've done everything to, to bring about this good fruit, this relationship, the covenant. But uh, unless you are willing I'm going to leave you to the briars and the thorns. I'm going to allow you to be burnt, your tower to be burned. And that's what happened to the temple. That's what happened to the city of Jerusalem. It was on this lovely hill. It speaks of it being a fruitful hill. That's Jerusalem. So sadly, all that God had wanted to do for Israel or Judah, um, he could not do because uh, of their choices. But Renier, in our lesson, and it's on the end here, he says, but God will reserve a remnant. Mm. There will be those who will say yes to this God. There will be those who will respond to his pleading and his entreaties of love. There will be those who will come and, and, and he will heal them and he will change their hearts and he will give them righteousness, the character that he wants for us. And then those remnant would reach out to those around them. And that's what's God's will for us today as well. Amen. A part of the lesson, the second part of the lesson um, what more was there to do for my vineyard wow. that I have not done in it? God says, I have done everything I everything. can for you to bring forth the good fruits. Yet mm. they chose to do everything opposite to what God has said and bring yeah, forth bad fruits. God says to us today, I will do everything for you and have done through Christ. Right so that we might be saved and be forgiven of our sins and not rebel against God and do what is right in his sight. So we don't have an excuse. We just need to claim Jesus Christ as our savior and be willing to be obedient to his will and to walk within his will. And what is his will? It's revealed in the scriptures. It's revealed in the spirit of prophecy, just magnified in the spirit of prophecy, what the scriptures has already said. So we can better understand his will for our lives. Brian, thank you so much for this first lesson. I really enjoyed this lesson already, this quarter, yeah. just by looking at Isaiah chapter one. To our viewers, may God bless you. We'll see you next week again in lesson number two. Let's just pray together before we end. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, thank you very much for the book of Isaiah. Really gives mm -hmm. us an insight to your plan, how you did everything for your people, yet they rebelled. I pray, Father, that we will not have the same mind but that we would have the mind of Christ and be willing, obedient subjects of the King of the universe. Please yes. forgive us of our sins and help us to turn from it and walk in your ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.